video from the Ville. This is uh, Dr. Greenewalt uh, for Government 112, for state and local government. Uh, today we want to take a look at mass media in state and local government. Um, it's a rather um, big subject and one that has certainly uh, changed fundamentally since 2008, um, unfortunately. Um, and that's an arbitrary date uh, that uh, I have uh, used, and uh, we'll, we'll see why as we get to it. But when we're looking at the mass media, the mass media's job is to present and um, to uh, cover uh, the news for us so that we have information on what is transpiring uh, in government, with public policy, and in uh, uh, the world around us. Uh, so if the job of the mass media is to cover the news, the first question I guess that we need to tackle is, what is the news? Uh, news is anything that um, is recent or recently disclosed uh, and is uh, of particular interest to the audience. Um, you find that um, news Again, should be recent events or recently disclosed events. News should be relevant to the audience's concern. Um, there always is this struggle uh, in the mass media, and we had it when I worked for Channel 21. For over 14 years, I was the, um, the uh, political analyst for Channel 21, uh, and uh, we also had a um, uh, daily show uh, on the new news. It was a three-minute show in a half hour. Uh, three minutes doesn't sound like very much, but uh, when you eliminate the, um, uh, the commercials, uh, the new news was uh, 22, 22 minutes, and I had three of those minutes. Uh, and uh, it was actually um, a, a nice... Uh, it was a nice time for a, a segment. Every new uh, segment, which was called Capital I, was delivered live. So every day I had to be at the state capitol and ready to roll uh, around noon. Uh, that we would uh, we'd go on the air live, and then we would they would generally uh, come to me around uh, around twelve. 08, 12, 10, something like that, and then I'd have the three-minute uh, segment called Capital I. So we uh, did that, and then, of course, I continue to have um, the show with Susquehanna Valley Center uh, on uh, Behind the Headlines, and then we also have the show on uh, re uh, discovering Pennsylvania's history makers on the Pennsylvania Cable Network. So um, we've done uh, quite a bit of media over the years, and the one thing that we would always discuss in the morning uh, before I would go to the Capitol for Capital I, uh, I'd go to the headquarters of Channel 21 uh, TV in Harrisburg, and I'd meet with the anchor, uh, and I'd meet with the uh, director of the new news. And we generally talk about, um, we generally talk about, um, uh, should we be stressing surface or should we be stressing significance? Uh, if you stress surface, you are simply reporting that something has happened. If you are stressing significance, you're trying to explain why that thing happened. Uh, we can report that there's a crime wave in Lancaster, but uh, can we dig deeper and discover what's the reason for that crime wave in Lancaster? Uh, you find that uh, because of a lack of manpower and resources and time, that on particular electronic media uh, in recent uh, years um, uh, surface wins almost all the time. We're just talking about an event, something that's happened. We're not necessarily going to dig into the reasons why that uh, was, why that has happened. Once we t talked about and discovered what the news is, 
The next thing we have to do is talk about what the functions of the news media are. What is the, the job of the mass media to accomplish? Well, there's three major things that they need to accomplish. One is to be a watchdog. They are supposed to expose government corruption. So number one is to be a watchdog. Number two is to be a gatekeeper to determine which issues are going to be dealt with, going to be examined uh, in the news. And third and finally is scorekeeper. And a scorekeeper, uh, this particular function is one in which um, the news media determines uh, who's ahead in public opinion, who is leading in different political races, uh, who's faring the best. Uh, so watchdog, gatekeeper, and scorekeeper. And uh, certainly at this uh, point in our history, the press is uh, much uh, more comfortable uh, playing the role of scorekeeper uh, than they are in terms of doing a good job at digging out and exposing government corruption or even being a, a gatekeeper. Uh, yes, they uh, will do that, but uh, it's so easy to try to determine, uh, say, uh, who's up and who's down. Well, as we look at the press in the United States and in our state and local governments, uh, we ought to look at uh, uh, the overall history of journalism in America. We certainly find that here in the United States, we have to remember that we have the freest press in the world. Uh, we tend to uh, overlook that or forget that. Um, we find that uh, uh, when we travel abroad, you'll see that uh, uh, there are limited amounts of uh, press or um, one that doesn't have access to the press um, or uh, you uh, can only gain access by uh, paying a large amount of money. Uh, for example, we were very surprised when we went to Great Britain to live there and uh, it was uh, the choices that we had on television when we arrived was BBC One, BBC Two, BBC Three, or BBC Four, British Broadcasting Corporation, all owned by the government. Uh, eventually Sky uh, came in to uh, play and they had Sky News on as well, which wasn't a government controlled uh, corporation. But the government owned all those uh, entities and they uh, controlled what was on those entities much more uh, actively and tightly than you'll find uh, generally, you know, you'll find in the United States. Um, we also find that in Great Britain you have to pay a television tax. In order to watch television and to receive it in your home, you have to pay a fee to the government. Of course, this is uh, uh, not the case uh, in the United States. Well, please remember that we do have the freest press anywhere in the world. And uh, are we, um, do we value that or are we protecting that uh, or are we uh, neglecting it? Let's take a look as we go along. Well, the press, you can say uh, the mass media started in the United States in the year 1704. In the year 1704, we have the first newspaper being published in America. It was the Boston Newsletter, and uh, the editor of the Boston Newsletter was a gentleman by the name of John Campbell. So John Campbell in 1704 with the Boston Newsletter uh, begins uh, mass media uh, in, the, um, in the United States. But journalism has a series of periods. Let's look at the periods of journalism and let's look at how each period uh, what are the characteristics of each period as we move from one to the next to the next? If we were to start out uh, with an examination of the mass media in American history, uh, the first era we would have to say would be from the founding of the country uh, all the way to the 1820s. So from the 1770s, the 1780s, all the way uh, to the 1820s, this is the era of the party press. We find that uh, how, what uh, news media, medium, what news medium did we have? Well, we had newspapers. And how were newspapers uh, assembled? 
Well, they were printed uh, by hand on very expensive printing presses that required um, you to assemble the lettering um, for each letter, um, put the uh, the uh, pl uh, put the uh, put the uh, uh, pieces into place, and then put ink over them. Uh, this was slow, uh, and it was very expensive. Uh, so we find that there weren't many uh, papers available, uh, and they were very, very expensive. Uh, furthermore, what else is true of the country at this time, from the 1770s and 1780s uh, until the 1820s, uh, the population of the country is small, so we don't have many people to sell a newspaper to. Uh, and we don't have many, because the population was small, uh, the number of businesses was small. So we didn't have many businesses that needed to uh, advertise. We don't have many people to buy the newspaper. Uh, so what are the organizations or the entities that are uh, around that want to transmit a message, that want to get a message out to the people. Well, first and foremost, they would have to be uh, the political parties. Um, the first two uh, parties, as we remember, were the Democratic Republican Party and the Federalist Party. They're the ones that really want to reach the people and get a message out. So they are the ones that provided the funding to start newspapers and to keep newspapers running. When you go back to the archives and you look at the uh, uh, old um, images, uh, for example, on microfiche uh, that we have of um, newspapers during this period, it's pretty easy to tell if it's a Federalist paper or if it's a Democratic Republican paper. Um, well, we find that uh, all the news in these newspapers was uh, absolutely, um, absolutely ideological. The ideology of that particular political party uh, suffuses the whole newspaper. Well, we go from the era of the party press to an era in the 1820s. When we get to the 1820s, we now have more advanced printing presses. Uh, they're cheaper. They can publish more papers uh, more quickly and more cheaply. So now we have thousands of papers that we can disseminate to the public, and we have more members of the public. Population has grown, so there are more people to buy the newspaper. There are more people, so there are more businesses, and more businesses to advertise. So we enter into a new period of time called the era of the popular press. Now in this era, we have to look at, in the first era, we looked at uh, uh, who had a message that they wanted to get out. And uh, it even, perhaps uh, didn't even matter, it certainly didn't matter if they made a profit or not. Well, in this new era, uh, we're looking at the development of businesses in America. We have a business because we want to make a profit. So we find if we want to make a profit, do we want to sell newspapers to just Federalists? Do we want to sell newspapers to just Democratic Republicans? No, we want to sell Democrats, I'm sorry, we want to sell the news to everyone. We want to sell the news to everyone. Uh, we want to sell newspapers to everyone. So what do we do? We take the ideology out of the newspaper uh, and we put the ideology all on the editorial page. So if we want to see the uh, ideology of the papers um, editors, um, you look at the editorial page, but the rest of the newspaper uh, it just, just simply tries to present the news uh, so that both Federalists and Democratic Republicans and later Democrats and Whigs will be buying uh, the newspaper. Um, this era of the popular press, in order to sell more newspapers, um, we find that uh, what is a uh, a tactic that uh, we have available to do that. Well, you see it when you go through the, um, to this day, you see it when you go through the uh, supermarket and you look at the racks uh, at the uh, cash register that are filled with newspapers. These are generally tabloid papers. 
and they engage in something that we call yellow journalism or sensationalism. Yellow journalism and sensationalism um, developed during this era uh, to sell more newspapers. Um, and it got its name, yellow journalism, um, by virtue of the fact that uh, the leading cartoon character of the age was a little boy named the Yellow Kid. And the Yellow Kid uh, for the 1800s, the 19th century, would be equivalent to Dennis the Menace today. Uh, I believe that he still has a uh, cartoon column in some newspapers, and you can certainly see reruns of Dennis the Menace on uh, the older t the TV shows that the channels, TV channels that air the older broadcast from the 50s and 60s. But uh, so you have Dennis the Menace, or um, you could have, um, um, oh, I'm forgetting the name of the um, little boy and the tiger, um, Kimberly, Kimberly, the little boy and the tiger, the cartoon character. Calvin and Hobbes. Thank you. Calvin and Hobbes, I need assistance from my, uh, uh, assistance from my camera crew here as I'm uh, having a, uh, a brain freeze. Uh, Calvin and Hobbes would be another example of uh, this little boy who was just like uh, uh, the yellow kid. Calvin was larger than life. He was, sens he was sensational, and so was the yellow kid. And that's where this um, uh, era ob obtains its name. Uh, the father of sensationalism, uh, of course, was William Randolph Hearst. William Randolph Hearst uh, accumulated the uh, ownership of more newspapers in America, more than anyone else. Uh, and he ran a chain, the Hearst newspaper empire went from Maine to California. Uh, some of you may have gone to California to visit Sam Sinian. Sam Sinian, of course, is his home in California. Um, massive uh, palace. Uh, there have been several documentaries on it uh, on PBS. I think it's a three or four Part series going through different parts of the of the house. Uh, that was a house just for his mistress, Marion Davis. Marion Davis was um, a film star, and he had uh, left uh, all the movie critics in his uh, newspaper empire strict orders that uh, when a new film from her was issued, they were all to give her good reviews or they'd be out the door. Uh, but uh, William Randolph Hearst um, was a um, uh, pioneer in putting out lots of yellow journalism to sell more copies. Um, you find that uh, uh, he was uh, particularly adroit at um, uh, tapping into the growing tensions between Spain and the United States. Um, we have uh, any number of examples uh, to show this. Um, there was one example in particular where an American a woman who was a passenger on a steamship, uh, her purse was searched as she went uh, on the uh, steamship. And that was it. Her purse was searched and she went on to the ship. Uh, when this was reported in uh, the uh, papers by um, Hearst, uh, you find that there was a pen and ink drawing of the American woman standing on uh, the uh, uh, board on board the ship uh, on deck, and she is naked. She is her hands, her arms in the air, and she is being patted down by some Spanish brutes with all the other passengers surrounding her, pointing at her and laughing at her. And in fact, nothing of the sort happened. But here. We go from uh, looking in someone's purse uh, for contraband to um, a uh, public strip search, uh, which never happened. But this kind of reporting led to a situation where the nation was more than ready to go to war with Spain when what happened? What was the ignition point? The ignition point, of course, was uh, the sinking of the U.S. Maine. Uh, our battleship, the U.S. Maine, um, exploded in the middle of the night in Havana Harbor. And um, to this day, we have three possible explanations 
as to what happened it was probably an accident it was probably not sabotage but with the sinking of the main we rallied around don't forget the main and we engaged in a brief war with Spain of course Admiral Dewey was able to conclude that rather quickly in Manila Harbor on the cruiser the Olympia you can see that you can see a ship and you can see his footprints where he stood on the bridge when he said fire when ready Gridley he was the commander of the fleet Gridley was the commander of the ship but this ship of course the Olympia was one of the fastest ships in the world at the time and was the pride of the fleet you find that you can still tour it in Philadelphia at Penn's Landing so the here we have this air of sensationalism where you have a kernel of truth that begins a story and it's blown out of all proportion simply to sell newspapers some years ago at Millersville Market they used to sell the what was it called the world there was a tabloid that was discontinued about three years ago on world world watch news something like that it's not the exact title but it was in all the supermarkets and you find that oh they had a front page story on Bill Clinton going to hell visiting Satan and then Rush Limbaugh dying and going to hell and visiting Satan they had pictures for the story then they had a picture at one point of a large dinosaur coming out of Lake Erie snapping at a plane a small recreational plane in flight I went ahead and I bought that and I sent it to a friend of mine in Erie whose father had a small plane so I put a note on there that he needed to beware of a flying condition but this is certainly just other examples of sensationalism well we go from an era of sensationalism the other thing that aids the development of sensationalism is the development of the wire service you have now during this period of time from the 1820s to the 1880s we now have the country united by the telegraph system we've now for the first time in 1848 we have a telegraph set up between New York and San Francisco before we relied on the mail which would travel by ship it would either go to Panama and then across the Isthmus and then put on a ship again and up the coast to San Francisco or it went all the way around the tip of South America and up the coast to San Francisco of course we developed the Pony Express a little bit later so we could move mail in a matter of days between San Francisco and between yes between St. Louis and San Francisco there's just a string of riders and ponies that just rode very quickly to deliver the mail as well well the advent of the telegraph brought along something called wire services the first wire service the most famous and still the largest one in America today was the AP the Associated Press in order to make money there was the founders of the Associated Press said we're going to take a reporter and put them in every major city in America they're going to report their news of the day by sending it to our headquarters in New York by telegraph and then our editors there will put piece the news of the country together so that we can send out a report on this is the news happening in America and we can send it to all the newspapers in the land who wish to subscribe who wish to pay us 
a certain fee and that's how they made a profit so this is the wire service and this develops in eight hundred forty eight the associated press was followed by the united press international we find that they competed uh... all through the nineteenth and twentieth centuries uh... we find that uh... as the twentieth century developed we find that upi was definitely catching up and they decided that they would report on stories which were more controversial stories which were more colorful, more flamboyant uh, than all the stories that perhaps were uh, issued by the AP. They also decided that they'd run with the story uh, even if they didn't have a, uh, a second confirmation on it. Um, and that is why uh, UPI was able to report on the assassination of President John Kennedy before the Associated Press was. Well, this um, competition continues well to the end of the uh, 20th century, and then we find the Associated Press has emerged as uh, being the dominant uh, uh, wire service. Uh, we have now that the British wire service, Reuters, uh, is more um, probably uh, more extensive and influential now than UPI. UPI was up for sale a number of years ago, um, and they are a shadow of their former self. As I said, the UPI reporter recently uh, was uh, simply a, uh, a college intern uh, serving in the um, um, press room of the uh, state capitol in Harrisburg. Well, in the 1880s, we get to the progressive era, don't we? And in the progressive era, uh, it's all about reform from the 1880s to the 1920s. Well, people wanted to read more than a few paragraphs about issues of the day. Uh, some of the people really wanted to dig deep into an issue. So we find the emergence of a new type of uh, press, and this would be magazines of opinion. Uh, this period runs from the 1880s to the 1920s. That develops uh, because of the progressive movement. And you find uh, that some of the um, magazines of opinion would have included um, You'd have it uh, Atlantic uh, and Harper's Bazaar, which we uh, still have uh, today. Uh, but you had other uh, magazines as well, such as McCall's, uh, that no longer exists. And uh, they would run lengthy um, investigations uh, of uh, uh, issues of public policy. This is really the beginning of investigative journalism. Uh, in the United States. Well, magazines of opinion now are uh, sort of holding sway uh, as in journalism, journalistic history in the United States, up until 1920. In 1920, we have the development of the radio. We have the first uh, radio broadcast on the night of the presidential election where Warren G. Harding wins in November of 1920. And what do you think the first radio station in America was? It was a radio station not from Los Angeles, not from Chicago, not from New York or Boston. It was a radio station from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania uh, had a radio station with the call letters of KDKA. KDKA, it's still there today. It's a CBS uh, affiliate. Uh, and uh, it uh, does quite well even today. But we find that uh, we have the development now of electronic journalism from uh, the 1920s to probably about 2000. We have the development of electronic journalism. As I said, we have radio, we have TV, um, but uh, KDKA in Pittsburgh is the first um, first radio station, and it's two years before the second radio station, which is w, uh, WJ. Uh, WWJ in Detroit, uh, Michigan, uh, you find uh, is established in 1922. Um, you find that um, uh, these radio stations uh, initially uh, didn't want to sell soap. They didn't want any parts uh, to do with 
commercial broadcasting. Uh, they thought that they would fund themselves much like many of the PBS stations are funded today. Uh, they thought that they would uh, finance their operations through um, contributions from uh, certain patrons, contributions from the public, uh, grants, uh, and uh, they would not have to get on the air and sell products. Well, they learned very quickly, KDKA and WWJ uh, learned very quickly that they were going to have to sell soap and they had to engage in commercial uh, advertising and that becomes par for the course then. Um, you find that um, as radio develops, we have a uh, national network developing, and um, you find that uh, it uh, uh, also that network not only supports radio, but eventually this new electronic uh, invention will appear as well, and that is, of course, the invention of television, which really gets going on uh, the aftermath of the Second World War. Uh, now, the first uh, television uh, network in America, uh, the national level, was the National Broadcasting Corporation, NBC. Uh, NBC was based in Rockefeller Center in New York City. Uh, to this day, you can take a tour of Rockefeller Center, and that's nice. You can take a tour of NBC, which is fantastic, or you can take a tour of both of them. Um, I recommended probably both of them. Uh, but uh, you can see where NBC is based today and always has been based. And they'll even take you in the uh, newsroom where they read the nightly news on NBC. So NBC was the first, uh, the second uh, news, uh, national news organization uh, that springs up uh, in America was CBS. CBS stands for the Columbia Broadcasting System uh, out of New York. They... Uh, they um, uh, follow in, in the footsteps of NBC. And finally, we have a third uh, network emerging uh, called ABC, the American Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, I remember ABC um, developing and it was uh, rather amusing. Uh, many of us thought, well, we already have NBC and CBS. Who needs anything else? We have two stations now. Why would we need a third? What could they possibly tell us? Uh, it was a, come somewhat of an amusing thought at the time. But uh, the American Broadcasting Corporation was particularly um, saved by the development of one show, and that was the wide world of sports. And you've seen the beginning of the wild war of the sports, uh, the wide world of sports, many times where the skier uh, is coming down the um, ski jump. Uh, that's actually a Norwegian gentleman, and he uh, falls on the way down, and uh, just uh, it's a tremendous wipeout, uh, and rolls all the way down the mountain. And actually, he uh, he was um, he lived. Uh, he had a few broken bones, but he was okay uh, in the long run. That particular sequence is that video clip is still shown today and the uh, wide world of sports uh, enabled uh, ABC uh, to um, exist long enough uh, to, um, uh, to, to build, uh, build their corporation. Um, you find that, uh, what's true about uh, this particular medium? Well, you find that in the newspapers you have time to tell a story and to look into um, a story um, and, of course, with the magazines of opinion, uh, that investigation could go much further. Now, with radio, uh, you have with uh, sound, uh, instant sound from the announcer to the home, and with television, you have a picture. So we now have the elimination of a filter. We no longer need a reporter to tell us uh, what um, one of our politicians or leaders is saying or doing. We can hear them say it. We can see them do it. So electronic journalism uh, is fantastic in the fact that we eliminate this filter between our, um, our public servants and ourselves. What isn't tremendous is that electronic journalism costs far more money, much more money uh, 
uh, than did the newspapers uh, to operate. So we find that um, in order to have a uh, uh, television news or radio news broadcast, uh, it's going to be uh, relatively short um, because it's so expensive and uh, therefore to get onto the news uh, you're going to have the news story is going to have to be very colorful or controversial uh, of course in many uh, television uh, news um, operations there's the old adage if it bleeds it leads uh, if there's violence involved um, chances are it's going to be covered and it's going to be at the beginning of the uh, uh, broadcast um, but we, uh, we find uh, that uh, with radio you wanted something that was, um, there was, a, there was, a, there was a distinct sound uh, to it uh, to report, but with television you want a picture um, and you want to show something. So it's not uh, just good enough to have the reporter at the Pentagon reporting a story while the Pentagon reporters reporting on the story. You want to have on the screen pictures of jets taking off of an aircraft carrier or pictures of tanks rolling through the desert. And because uh, you need to have an interesting picture on the screen uh, at all points. So there's a smaller spectrum of news to report on this more expensive medium of electronic journalism. And what uh, politicians uh, began to realize is the, um, uh, the audience that they could reach on electronic journalism was so much larger uh, eventually than the audience that they get from being in a newspaper. Uh, so um, we find public figures began to uh, behave in more flamboyant ways in order to attract press coverage. This is why you have um, Oh, this is why you have Mayor Reed, and he's elected as the mayor of Harrisburg uh, for, for at least a year or two. Uh, he went out every week, you know, one day a week, and he served in a civilian job. He was nurse for a, a day. He was a policeman for a day. Um, he was a truck driver for a day, um, and he was, or he was a cook for a day. And he did that because he knew Channel, I'm not, I don't remember if it was Channel 27, which is ABC, or Channel 21, which was CBS. One of the newspaper, uh, one of the um, television channels, excuse me, I believe it was Channel 27, followed him and reported on him and showed him uh, in action on that day. So he got lots of good press from it. Uh, and the people thought, wow, uh, here is a mayor, a mayor of the people because uh, he's out here uh, trying to learn more about all of our jobs uh, and actually doing them, uh, and they embraced him for that. Um, so you have politicians behaving in much more um, flamboyant ways. Uh, there was in Michigan, Bill Ballinger. Bill Ballinger was a Republican state senator who wanted to run for the um, Republican uh, nomination for um, the U.S. Senate, and he did. He decided he was going to do something that had never been done in Michigan state history. He decided he was going to walk the length of the Michigan Peninsula in the dead of winter, uh, and he started his walk uh, on the International Bridge uh, at the border between Canada and the United States, and he walked across the International Bridge up to our campus at Lake Superior State University. And he walked right into my uh, classroom, right into the social studies building, into my classroom, and uh, the first uh, speech of his campaign was to my class, me and American government. Um, now, what he was hoping to do was get lots of free publicity as he went along, as he went from town to town to town. In the dead of winter in Michigan, uh, the local radio station, the local television station would show up and say, well, uh, how much frostbite do you have? How many toes have you lost? How many fingers have you lost? Uh, he got lots of free press uh, by doing something that was just outrageous uh, because the uh, winter temperatures there are uh, 
um, are um, life-threatening. Uh, you find that exposed flesh will freeze within two to three minutes, uh, and uh, it's tough um, operating in that kind of environment in the wintertime uh, in Michigan. But uh, Bill Ballinger made that trip, uh, but he did it just to be on the ele electronic journalism. So this is the era of electronic journalism. We find that we are probably today um, somewhere around the uh, gate of 2000. I probably think that we would have to say that we are in an era of cyber journalism today. Um, I think we're probably in this new period where now we uh, depend less and less on our national newscasts. We depend less on the nightly news broadcasts from NBC, ABC, CBS, Fox, and from PBS. We depend less on that, and now we are getting lots of news from uh, different, um, different outlets uh, on the internet and in social media. Um, unfortunately, what we do uh, at this point is we tend to go to those particular sites on the internet that agree with um, with, our, um, uh, with our attitudes, so we don't get any new information, we don't get all points of view. Uh, that's something you have to bear in mind as you're uh, looking to um, be an effective public servant. You have to look at all the different points of view every day. You need to scan a variety of newspapers, look at a variety of news sources to get the um, a, a better picture of what actually has happened. Um, so we uh, probably are now, we are now in this era of cyber journalism. But what are the rules that govern the media that we need to know about? Um, first of all, we need to be familiar with the, uh, with the rules for libel. Libel is, of course, um, not telling the truth. Uh, and you find that uh, the way that the law is structured, uh, it's different uh, for public figures and private figures. Now, you can be considered a public figure uh, if you are, goodness, a, um, uh, if uh, you are a, um, a school board member, if you are a treasurer for your, ch for your church, uh, if you are the head of a crime watch um, detail in your neighborhood, uh, you are easily classified uh, as a public figure through any involvement in public organizations. And then the rules for libel are far more difficult. It's harder for you to sue for libel uh, than it is for a totally private individual. Certainly the one individual who uh, probably, uh, and he did several times, probably needed the protection of libel laws the most in the second half of the 20th century uh, was none other than uh, uh, the, uh, that host of The uh, Tonight Show, uh, the show that Jimmy uh, Fallon has today. Uh, you find that The Tonight Show host at that time was Johnny Carson. He was host for over uh, 30 years and uh, he had been um, married three times, and uh, the press was uh, very happy to gleefully report on uh, things that happened in his life and make up a few things along the way as well. Uh, but uh, he really couldn't sue for libel. We don't see any public figure suing successfully for libel against a news outlet until we get to Carol Burnett, the comedian. Carol Burnett uh, is at dinner one evening uh, at the Rive Gauche, a French restaurant in Georgetown in Washington, D.C., and she's in the same uh, restaurant with Henry Kissinger. And um, the, um, um, uh, the story that was released uh, about her by the National Enquirer, uh, Inquiring Minds Want to Know, uh, the National Enquirer reported that uh, uh, she saw Henry Kissinger uh, and his company, uh, his party, when she was going out the door. So she walked over to his table, picked up his drink, and threw it in his face. Uh, 
Well, uh, that wasn't the story at all. What really happened, again, the germ of the, tr of, the tr of the truth was that, yes, she saw Henry Kissinger as she was going out the door. She waved her hand to him, and he saw her and waved his hand to her, and that was it. Uh, but the National Enquirer reported it in quite a different manner. Uh, so that is uh, another example of uh, sensationalism, but Carol Burnett sued for that uh, incident and won. Um, and that was one of the few examples of a, a public figure uh, winning that sort of um, legal action. Disclosure of sources is another uh, situation that we ought to take a look at. Uh, we find that the United States Supreme Court and most state Supreme Courts, they have upheld uh, the need for reporters to go ahead and disclose, to reveal their sources uh, for a news story if the disclosure would significantly affect uh, or assist in solving a crime. Um, however, whether or not a source, is, uh, whether or not a reporter is going to be forced to disclose a source is done on pretty much a case-by-case -case basis. Not all state Supreme Courts agree with this. Uh, some, most do, but not all, and each case tends to be different. We also find that there are some communities who have actually passed what are called shield laws. Harrisburg, Pennsylvania has a shield law uh, that's supposed to protect reporters from having to disclose their sources. Reporters don't wish to disclose their sources. Why? Because they want to use those sources for future stories. And if they have to disclose their sources, uh, they might jeopardize their uh, sources, um, and they certainly or might not, uh, they won't be able to use them for information in the, uh, in the future. Um, this disclosure of sources got to be a real problem uh, in the um, 19, it was the uh, 1970s, 1980s, uh, there was a, um, a story about a little boy in Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, this story um, was discovered um, by a uh, young reporter uh, who just graduated from Yale. Uh, her first name is Janet. And uh, Janet is a very um, eager, uh, hardworking reporter for the Washington Post. And uh, you find that uh, she started to report uh, on a story of this little boy um, who uh, lived with his mom and uh, her boyfriend. And apparently the mom and the boyfriend were uh, cocaine and heroin addicts, and they didn't want to have all the fun by themselves, so they started to shoot up the little boy, the 10-year-old boy as well. Uh, and she reported on this. Um, the pressure on her became tremendous to reveal her sources so they could find the boy and rescue the boy. She took the position, however, that if she revealed uh, her sources and the, um, the location of the boy, the mother would grab the boy, they would disappear, and would never be uh, able to help him again. Uh, well, uh, these stories continued and the pressure on her mounted so that finally uh, she stepped forth and she said, it's all made up. It's all fiction. Uh, I simply had so much pressure on me uh, to engage in investigative journalism uh, that I finally decided I had to make up a story uh, that would be larger than life. And that's exactly what she did um, in the pages of the Washington Post. Uh, she lost her job and uh, uh, last time that PBS reported on her whereabouts, she was, I believe, selling lingerie in a department store in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, but uh, never to be a reporter uh, again. Disclosure of sources. Um, equal time provision. The equal time provision is one that essentially says if you are going to have a candidate for public office on your show, then you have to... Um, give uh, equal time to all candidates for that particular uh, position. So equal time provision. This is something that we have to be aware of in our television show, Behind the Headlines. If we have a 
uh, person, a newsmaker on our show, if that newsmaker is running for an office uh, in an upcoming election, we have to be careful to offer uh, airtime to the opponents of that particular individual as well. Uh, so that's the equal time provision. Um, this gets to be a real problem when we look at uh, debates for the presidency because normally there are, with minor parties, there are always 20, 25 or more candidates for the presidency. How could we possibly have a debate, a uh, presidential debate, with all those candidates uh, on stage? Well, we've gotten around it by letting um, different organizations sponsor uh, the debate rather than ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS, Fox uh, sponsoring the debate. The debate will be sponsored by some private group and then the news uh, networks will cover it as a news item and that's the way we can get around um, equal time provision. However, it's important to note that PBS every presidential season, at one point they do have a um, public debate where they have all the candidates, all the minor candidates generally, the Republican and the Democrat are never there, but all the other political, the minor political parties, uh, their representative is there and they generally have a spirited debate and you can watch it on PBS. Well, other rules governing the media are the public service broadcasting requirement. Public service broadcasting requirement simply says that all radio stations television stations have to donate 5% um, of all their airtime for community usage. Um, what we find uh, happens with that is generally the radio stations and television stations will air um, things in the middle of the night. Uh, you'll have uh, some programs from uh, 1 a.m. to uh, 5 a.m. Uh, and uh, they will be your uh, uh, programs that contain community content and uh, are the programs that, uh, the material that uh, uh, the radio or television show uh, station uses to meet their public service broadcasting requirements. Lastly, we have something called the Fairness Doctrine. Now, the Fairness Doctrine was in place uh, from the beginning of electronic journalism um, all, all the way to the Reagan administration. And the federal, um, the federal, um, um, well, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. The federal Communications Commission uh, had uh, said to all radio and TV stations that they need to present both sides of issues. They needed to be fair. Uh, Ronald Reagan regarded this as a uh, censorship of speech. Uh, so consequently, he directed the Federal Communications Commission uh, to disregard this. Uh, before this time, you would have radio talk shows, for example, or television talk shows, and uh, for example, WHP uh, had had a radio talk show in the morning which was uh, liberal, and in the afternoon, they had a radio talk show of the same length that was conservative. And this went on uh, throughout the country. Uh, once the um, um, Fairness Doctrine was struck down by the Reagan administration, uh, we see um, that uh, this, in mo many instances, doesn't apply any longer, and one show or the other tends to predominate. We find that certainly um, one uh, area where uh, conservative thought uh, and conservative speech was uh, allowed to surface and flourish is um, radio talk shows. Um, radio talk, and uh, this is particularly championed by um, uh, Rush Limbaugh. Uh, Rush Limbaugh did something on radio that no other person had done before. He took a radio talk show, and instead of restricting it to uh, one region of a state, uh, he solicited 
uh, and his team went out and signed up radio stations all through the country, and they broadcast his um, uh, his show uh, simultaneously every day. Uh, this had not been done before, and it built a huge audience of 20 to 20 million people. Today, his audience numbers between 20 and 30 million every day, uh, and um, he uh, makes a comfortable living. <laughs> but um, Rush um, is the reason probably why AM radio exists today. AM radio was, um, I grew up listening to music on AM radio, and by the time I got to uh, senior high and college, everyone was listening to radio on FM and everyone was looking for a purpose. What will AM do? Well, eventually we find that now it's uh, where talk radio exists and uh, Rush Limbaugh is given credit for saving AM radio. Uh, we find that he is also the reason for uh, Democrats in the Congress that are calling for the reinstitution of the Fairness Doctrine. And uh, they want the Fairness Doctrine reinstituted because of um, because of Rush Limbaugh dominating the radio waves. Uh, but what Rush, how Rush would respond to that, of course, is by saying that uh, he is the balance. Because if you look on television or most any other uh, media outlets, uh, they are dominated by liberal thought and have been for decades. Well, this takes us, that particular thought, takes us to uh, an examination of national media versus state and local media. Uh, very quickly, let's look at the national media. What does the national media consist of in the United States? Uh, the national media consists of, uh, at least when we're looking at um, national television networks, we have what? We have NBC, we have CBS, we have ABC, uh, we have PBS, we have CNN, and we have Fox. On uh, the national radio networks, uh, they have evolved and changed over time. We find that NBC, ABC, and CBS all have national radio networks, but they're a shadow of their former selves. Uh, and we have now uh, Clear Channel, Affinity, Fox, National Public Radio all have um, uh, networks of their own, along with uh, Cumulus. Um, so these, uh, the, that things are changing more quickly uh, on the national radio scene than in any other area. National newspapers, we find that since we are a federal system, uh, we are going to have local uh, newspapers uh, to cover local government and local events. Uh, if you have a unitary country, such as France or such as the United Kingdom used to be, you can have all newspapers coming out of the nation's capital, uh, and that certainly was the case in uh, Great Britain in the past. All the great newspapers uh, emanated from London. There were local newspapers, but they were generally published once a week, who got married, who died, um, that sort of thing. But um, national newspapers in America uh, we don't have nearly as many as uh, some of the, say, uh, the unitary state of the former United Kingdom used to be. What are national newspapers? Well, you have to look, uh, and you'll find that the largest selling newspaper in America today is USA Today. And that really began in the 1980s. Up until that point, the largest uh, selling newspaper in America was the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal was always the largest selling newspaper in America because every businessman and businesswoman decided they needed to have this paper. They needed to read it every day, and they still feel that way. But in the 1980s, we had the development of USA Today, and it was, um, a, um, uh, it was a revolution because what did they do? Uh, they used colored ink. They used lots of colored ink. Uh, they brought color to the newspaper. Uh, in the past, we were always excited that uh, uh, you'd have a red uh, headline at Christmas time or New Year's or Easter. The rest of the paper was all black print uh, with a few black and white photographs. What USA Today did is they brought color photographs uh, in and they had them throughout their newspaper. 
But they also put together something interesting. There's one page of USA Today that's there every day, and it has a listing of all 50 states and what are the top news stories in each one of the 50 states. Uh, in addition to that, they revolutionized uh, sports reporting. We had never seen a sports page like USA Today develop. Scores and scores of pictures, lots of, in, lots of human interest stories about sporting figures, lots of charts and graphs, all in color. Uh, previously, when we would look at the sports section of a newspaper, we'd see the box scores for the baseball game from last night. We might see a listing of the standings for baseball, uh, football, hockey, basketball, but uh, the sports page was rather small uh, and uh, wasn't, uh, uh, didn't stand out. Uh, USA Today changed the, the, the newspaper world in America uh, by making the sports page something spectacular. And so USA Today, uh, to this day, is our largest selling uh, newspaper. You find that other papers that could be considered as national papers uh, would of course be the New York Post, actually founded, remember, by Alexander Hamilton. Uh, we have the New York Daily News, which is a broadsheet. Uh, this is something that my grandfather bought every weekend. Uh, of course, you have the New York Times. Uh, you have the Washington Post. You have the Washington Times. Um, and you have the Los Angeles Times, at least for part of America west of the Mississippi River. Those are uh, the only papers that we could really consider to be national papers in the United States. Now, why does it matter what the distinction is between national media and, say, state media? Well, you find that the national media tends to be much better paid. Uh, I think Barbara Walters was the first woman, uh, female news person in America who has paid a million dollars a year uh, to be one of the anchors on the ABC Nightly News. Uh, along with Howard K. Smith and uh, Harry Reisner. Um, you find that um, the reporters in larger markets, the New York market, the Los Angeles market, the Washington, D.C. market, they make more money than uh, certainly reporters in uh, uh, markets like Harrisburg or Reading and so forth. Uh, and that's why uh, news people are always on the move going from one city to the next, to the next, to the next, always looking for uh, that higher paying job uh, until you get to the uh, national media where hopefully you're, uh, the salaries are spectacular. So national news media people are paid a lot more and quite frankly national news coverage is far more liberal uh, than state uh, news coverage. Uh, how can I say this? Well, uh, what we do, how did we get to determine a person's ideology? One of the ways was self-description. Uh, we find that the uh, Washington Post and uh, ABC News uh, back in the uh, 1980s, uh, back before the 1984 election, had conducted a uh, survey. They sent out a... Um, a uh, communication a survey to every member of what would be considered the national media and ask them to describe themselves. What is their ideology? Do you consider yourself to be a moderate, a liberal, a conservative, or something else? Uh, and what did we find from that and every other survey that's been done of that ilk since that time? Uh, we find that uh, about 85% of all national media people describe themselves as being liberal. Uh, and we could talk about the reasons for that, and um, I'd be happy to do that with you sometime if you'd uh, like to know. Um, well, we find that there have been also changes in the media in the uh, post-Vietnam War era that are important to note. Um, the media has changed in the aftermath of Watergate and the aftermath of Vietnam in a number of ways. Uh, you find that first of all, the media used to make a differentiation between a person's private life and their personal life. Um, 
between their private life and their professional life, I should say, excuse me, uh, you find that um, the news never took pictures of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in his wheelchair. Uh, his uh, team made them promise not to take pictures of him in the wheelchair, uh, and they did not, and they did not report on his infirmity. Of course, he was fitted with steel braces uh, that enabled him to stand, and then he perfected uh, a method of moving forward where he would have a cane in one hand and he would take the arm of his son or one of his aides in the other and he would simply throw uh, his one leg forward with the steel brace uh, and then use that to balance himself and move the other leg forward. Uh, he learned how to do this in his uh, attempts to regain his mobility after suffering poly polio. Uh, it was a valiant attempt, and he did as well as anyone could, uh, and yet he was able to uh, at least reestablish in the public mind the belief that uh, he could stand, uh, he could stand easily, and he could still walk, uh, but he had had polio. They thought it was an amazing recovery. Uh, but, uh, and you find, of course, all the um, romantic affairs, uh, in the past, uh, all the mistresses, for example, that John F. Kennedy had um, that are well documented, um, never reported the press drew a line between the personal life and the professional life. Uh, that ends in after Watergate, doesn't it, when Gary Hart uh, is uh, involved with uh, the Democratic uh, U.S. Senator from Colorado when he... Uh, is uh, questioned by the press whether or not he's having an affair. And he says, well, follow me if you don't believe me. I'm not having an affair. Uh, and of course, they several days later, they photograph him and confront him as he comes out of um, Donna Rice's uh, condominium in Georgetown. Uh, I guess he said he was there for constituent service, um, but uh, he had been there all night. Um, we find today uh, you can't uh, you can't uh, get away with that. So the press no longer differentiates between a personal's professional and uh, private life. Uh, number two, the press in the past used to notify a public official if they were doing a story on them. They would notify them as a courtesy, and they would also check the accuracy of the facts that they're using in the story. Uh, that is not done anymore. Uh, if the press is doing a story about a political figure, uh, chances are overwhelmingly that the person will not know about that story, and uh, chances are that uh, facts in that story are not going to be check checked uh, as they were in the past. Lastly, in the past, the press used to consider holding a story for the good of the state or the good of the country. Um, that is not really done much anymore at all. Uh, you find that um, the Kennedys, uh, when President Kennedy was in office, uh, that his um, family, an extended family, uh, would uh, conduct, uh, they'd engage in uh, touch football games uh, around McLean, Virginia, with a variety of uh, other celebrities from Washington, D.C. Uh, ben Bradley, the editor of the Washington Post, for example. And at one of these games, Ben Bradley asked President Kennedy, is it true that uh, we're preparing a group of Cuban um, uh, emigres, um, Cuban um, uh, refugees from the Castro regime, uh, we're going to uh, help them um, try to recover the island. Uh, is this true? And President Kennedy looked at Ben Bradley and said, Ben, it is. I'd appreciate it if you'd hold the story. I'll give the Washington Post the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the first crack at all the information. I'll give them an exclusive about that if you'll just hold the story. And so the Washington Post did. And the Kennedy administration launched the Bay of Pig, the Bay of Pigs invasion. Uh, it wasn't uh, well thought out, well researched, and well planned. Uh, and certainly what doomed it was when President Kennedy uh, denied the use of U.S. air cover 
that had always been part of the plan. Uh, our planes were there, and pilots were over the uh, Cuban National Guard. We landed these Cuban refugees at a point um, that was ill-considered. It should have been in the southeast corner of the island so that they could have uh, just infiltrated, uh, retreated into the mountains and into the jungles as Castro did. That was their hope. Instead, they were set ashore at the Bay of Pigs, which was on the uh, southwest corner of the island, and it just so happened that they were set ashore at a point where the Cuban National Guard was conducting uh, routine exercises about a quarter mile away, only a quarter mile away. When the Cuban National Guard heard that uh, there was an invasion uh, in progress, they simply moved their machine guns over to the beach, and as the Cubans came ashore, they mowed them down. Now, our uh, Air Force pilots that were over the uh, scene said they could have eliminated uh, the Cuban National Guard in a matter of minutes, but President Kennedy, for whatever reason, never gave them permission. Uh, and so uh, the Cuban refugees were annihilated, and President Kennedy uh, had uh, nightmares of that massacre uh, for the rest of his life. He would wake up in the middle of the night and ask Jackie uh, why that had happened and uh, how could that have possibly happened. It haunted him for the remainder of his his life. Uh, and then he thought, uh, eventually, I wish that Ben Bradley wouldn't have held the story. I wish he would have run the story. Maybe we would have done a better job of looking into uh, this particular uh, project. Uh, it was a project that was begun under the Eisenhower administration. Uh, and uh, you have a problem when you pass one project on from one administration to the other. Uh, that. Uh, it can be some flaws in it, and apparently that uh, was true with the Bay of Pigs. Um, finally, what's the effect of the media? Uh, this becomes a very important question. Uh, can the media um, throw an election one way or the other? Uh, we find that uh, as we look at the things that influence electoral decisions, uh, certainly the mass media is one of them. But we have to keep in mind that the mass media is just one cue, C-U-E, just one cue uh, in the whole area of uh, people receiving uh, information uh, about, uh, public, uh, about the public sector and about public policy. So the media might affect an election in the closest, closest, closest of elections. Uh, but generally, it's just one cue of many that voters have to consider, and we have to uh, keep that in mind and remember that. So, the media is just one of many voting cues that's out there. Um, we can talk about the mass media uh, for the rest of the year easily, uh, and I'd love to talk about it more with some of you. Uh, give me a call, send me an email if you'd like more information. I'm happy to talk uh, to any of you at much greater length about any of these topics. Um, so uh, look for the next lesson on the video from the Ville and here on YouTube, and I'll see you then. Sweet!